evening, everyone. Welcome back to Seven Deadly Myths in Christianity, continuing Bible study series that is going on. And tonight, we're going to look at another one of those myths, a very exciting topic. But I want to make a statement to you. You tell me what you think of this. Not everything that is popular is right. Would you agree with that? Not everything that is popular is right. Well, here's another one. Not everything that is right is popular. Amen. I want to thank you for joining us, whether you're here in the sanctuary with us, whether you're watching at home in the local area, across the country, or around the world. We uh, hope that you have been blessed by this series, and as we continue, uh, we believe that tonight and tomorrow night is some of the greatest topics that the deceptions of the devil have, have really uh, had their work. And so I hope that you will uh, continue to, to uh, be blessed by our series. Uh, Jonathan is going to come out now and sing for us. assurance Jesus is mine Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine Heir of salvation Purchase of God Born of His Spirit Washed in His blood this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long perfect submission perfect delight visions of rapture now burst on my sight angels descending bring from above Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, 
praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Amen. Beautiful. Let's start with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, once again we are so grateful that we're able to gather together and open up your word, study a very important topic tonight, uh, a topic that we find in the book of Revelation and also in the book of Daniel. So Lord, we ask for your spirit to come and guide us. We know the Bible is your book, and if we are to correctly understand it, we need the leading of the Holy Spirit. So be with those who are here in person and also those who are joining us uh, on the internet and on the various television networks. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. I don't know about you, but I have thoroughly enjoyed the presentations thus far that uh, Scott has brought to us. Amen? Uh, just some wonderful insights and some thoughts and some new things that I hadn't seen before. So I'm looking forward to tonight's presentation. Very important one, dealing with the subject of the beast power and uh, the mark of the beast. So we are glad you are here. We'd like to invite Scott to come out at this time. I want to invite you to turn to Daniel chapter 2. We're going to study some prophecy tonight. Do you like Bible prophecy? I love Bible prophecy. In fact, the next three nights are tonight and tomorrow and Friday night. We're going to be looking at prophecy. And obviously, as I said earlier in the series, we're not getting to everything relating to these seven deadly myths. I do want to remind you to put your email address in at deadlymythsbook.com so we can get you that free book when that comes out. Very, very important to fill in all the gaps. And also, as I was thinking about prophecy and going, okay, at the end of preparing all of this, this 10-part series, what are we missing? What, what, what prophecies would be necessary? Next in line to study, and so a new series, an idea was born. It is not out yet. Uh, America's 11th hour, 400 years of providence and prophecy. So you can see the graphic there of the pilgrims, the 400th anniversary of the first Thanksgiving coming up. So this series, America's 11th hour, studying America in prophecy and God's providence leading and developing this free land. So the website there for the free email again, or the email um, to, to, to get notified about that series, providenceandprophecy.com. How about Mark of the Beast, Myths, Part 1? Now, tonight we won't specifically talk about the mark. Tomorrow, the mark. Tonight, just the beast. Because before you identify the mark of the beast in prophecy, you have to allow the Bible to do the teaching to our hearts and minds of who is the beast, the Antichrist. He goes by many names, I'm sure you've heard. The lawless one, the little horn, the man of sin, the beast power of Revelation 13. Many different names, but the myth is pretty much this. We're up to number five now, myth number five, that, oh, you can't really know who the Antichrist is or what his mark is. Oh, maybe in the future, that's key, sometime he will appear in the future and maybe give everybody a microchip in their hand or something like that, and the impression is given by the popular prophecy gurus that this is a secular leader that arises and places himself in Israel, and we'll talk about that Friday night, actually. Well, one thing we can know is just what the word Antichrist means. I want you to see it straight out of the Strong's Concordance. The definition of Antichrist here is either one who puts himself in the place of the Messiah or the enemy of the Messiah. Isn't this exactly what 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 said? We studied that the second meeting that this, the, the Antichrist will come and place himself in the very church of God and he will come up like the son of perdition. And you know that from John 17 verse 12, the son of perdition was Judas Iscariot. So the Antichrist power will be in the midst of the very body and people of God, the body of Christ, the church. He's going to do a rise from within that and place himself within that and proclaim himself to be God, it says there also in 2 Thessalonians. Now, you read in the, in the Strong's Concordance definition there a key phrase that I had underlined in red. The definition of antichrist 
in the place of Christ. So the idea of some secular ruler in the future, well, think more about a usurper, somebody who places himself in the position of in the very church of God as that son of perdition. Now let's study Daniel 2 together. Daniel 7 identifies this power very clearly. You're not going to come away tonight with any wonderings or shall we speculate and wonder who the beast power, the little horn power is. The Bible will be so crystal clear. It's a beautiful, beautiful teaching from his word. But before we get into Daniel 7, Daniel 2 lays the groundwork and the foundation and these two chapters will run parallel to each other. So let's start in Daniel 2, but before before we read in verse 25, I want to set the stage for you and what was going on at the time of Daniel chapter 2. Daniel the prophet is an advisor in the, king of, in the court of King Nebuchadnezzar. And as an advisor, Daniel might have some advice for Nebuchadnezzar on the matters of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He comes with this frustrating thing. I had this important dream and I don't remember the substance of it. And he calls in all of his, his uh, soothsayers and his Chaldeans and his magicians and such and all the pagans can't tell him what his dream is because he's demanding that they read his mind and they go, nobody can do such a thing. He gets all upset and he issues this edict to kill all the advisors. Well, Daniel's one of the advisors. So he and his friends pray and they gain access to the king. Give us a chance because the God of heaven is going to give you this this answer. That's what we're going to read here in verse 25 of Daniel 2. Arioch quickly brought Daniel before the king. This is the uh, assistant to the king. Brings Daniel before Nebuchadnezzar and says thus to him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream? which I have seen, and its interpretation. Well, Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But I can because I'm really great. Is that what he says there? No, he, he gives glory to God. There is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. You ready? Here he's going to do it. He says, you, your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. The king, do you think the king is a little skeptical here? Is this young fellow really going to be able to tell me what my dream was? Did his God make known my dream and the interpretation? So this prophet of, of the Jewish nation, the, the, one of the captives of Judah, is he going to rise to prominence here as one who can do such a thing? Well, let's see in verse 29. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. So this is going to be a prophecy about the future. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. You see, this is going to be a prophecy about the future. But as for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living. But for our sakes, who make known the interpretation to the king, that you may know the thoughts of your heart. You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image, that great image whose splendor was excellent, stood before you. And its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands. Oh, that's an interesting phrase. Some translations render that without human hands. Can you think of another place in the Bible where a stone was cut out without human hands, with divine hands? You're thinking of the Ten Commandments right now, aren't you? So this is a divine act that's going to interpose in history and struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. That's what the stone did. It destroyed the statue and the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found 
And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain that filled the whole earth. Ooh, we're going to come back to that part. That's the best part of the prophecy. The stone that fills the whole earth. The stone that had struck the image. But there's a graphic presentation of the text we just read. Daniel explaining to Nebuchadnezzar what his dream was. You had an image. The head was of gold. The chest and arms were of silver. The belly and thighs were of bronze. And the legs were of iron. Those feet were were of partly iron and partly clay. So let's read on to the meaning of the dream now in verse 36. He says, this is the dream. Now we will tell you the interpretation of it before the king. Because you know, really, the God who can read your mind also can give you meaning to your life. You see the symbolism there. He's going to give the meaning of the dream now. And this is the same God that knows our thoughts and gives meaning to our lives to worship him and live for him. So what is the meaning of this dream? You, O king, are a king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. And now listen to these six words. It gives the definition of the head of gold. You are this head of gold. What does the gold symbolize? Whose kingdom? Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. He said, you, the one who's got this kingdom where all the birds and animals and all the people of the world are under your dominion, that is represented by the head of gold. Now, Nebuchadnezzar knows how wealthy his kingdom. He's like, yep, gold, that's us. Uh, the, the wealthiest kingdom in history. Uh, gold, uh, you could go on and, and track the quantities of gold that they had amassed in the city of Babylon. Unbelievable. And he figures his kingdom's going on forever and ever and ever because uh, that's what the inscriptions say. May your kingdom last forever. You find it in the archaeology. And this is the most powerful and wealthy kingdom ever. There's no way he's going anywhere, right? Well, listen to the next words. He probably liked the part that he's in the dream, but then in verse 39, the first three words are, but after you, oh, that's a sour note to Nebuchadnezzar who had his pride boosted just a tad there. He's really going to get humbled in a, in a couple of chapters. I'll tell you about that in a few minutes, but he says, but after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. Now, wait a minute. There's going to be another kingdom after me? How do you know? Well, this is prophecy, and God foretells the future. So let's take a look at the first two images here on the screen. Babylon ruled for its dominion and its imperial period there, but following Babylon, another kingdom did arise. And historians identify that as the Medo-Persian Empire. We know who that conqueror was that conquered Babylon, and we'll, we'll talk about that in, in just a moment. But he says, after you, this kingdom shall arise and shall be inferior to yours. Now, was the Medo-Persian Empire just as powerful as the Babylonian Empire, just as wealthy as the Babylonian Empire? Well, they conquered them, but they never rose to that level of wealth. And who was this conqueror? Are you familiar with Cyrus the Great? Don't you love these names? The Great. Okay, well, let's take that. But... It's said in Isaiah, actually, chapter 44, it names Cyrus. It says there will be somebody named Cyrus who comes along. And you know what Cyrus did to conquer this impregnable city with these massive walls? He diverted the Euphrates River, which had, which had um, flowed through the city. And at that point, they were inside thinking nobody would ever be able to get in. But they went under the wall because there was no river now that flowed through the city and they came in and conquered. If you read in Isaiah 44 verses 27 to 28, it says Cyrus will, say, will tell God's people, build the temple. Do you know who it was that told the Jews to go back? Remember when we studied that the first night in Daniel 9? That was Cyrus who said there's going to be an edict in 457 BC to tell you to go back to your homeland, rebuild your city with a wall, rebuild your temple with the worship services. That's amazing, isn't it? That, that the Lord was able to foretell that in the book of Isaiah way ahead of time. And it includes, includes the phrase, dry up the rivers, right there in Isaiah 44, verses 27 to 28. Another study that you can look at uh, on, your, on your own time. But let's look now at the second half of verse 30, 39, and we'll see 
who comes next. It says, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. So Daniel's saying, none of these kingdoms are the permanent empire that rules forever and ever. You've got first Babylon, and then after you won, and then after you won. Well, did somebody conquer the Persians? Absolutely. That would be Alexander the Great and the Greek Empire. The next ruling power, the next empire was the Greeks. Then we read in verse 40, and the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as what? Iron. What were those legs made of? Made of iron. And it says, Inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything, and like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all others. Who was the most military ruthless, the most powerfully dominant, ruling all the way from England to India? It was the consolidation of the most power any empire had ever had in human history under the Roman Empire. Amazing that they were that, that, that Daniel was able to predict there's going to be this one that's inferior and then this one and then this one which is as strong as iron is going to dominate. Now you say, well, he could be getting lucky so far uh, because, you know, empires follow and they succeed one after the other. After all, we had the Assyrians fall to the Babylonians and before them was the Egyptians and empires tend to do that. So you can say Daniel got lucky. Well, how did he know the king's dream, first of all? But for us, looking back on this history, is this prophetically solid? What you see next is unbelievable. Because when I, I want to I ask you, what empire conquered the Roman Empire? Well, you know how Rome fell, don't you, from your Western civilization. They weren't conquered by the next empire. They were simply divided and fell from within. They were divided. Remember that word. Let's read now in verse 40. 41, whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom, the iron one, the fourth one, shall be, what's that next word? Divided. That's amazing. How is Daniel able to predict? Well, he says, the Lord gives us these things. What will come to pass after this? This is not a big deal to Daniel. He's like, the God of heaven knows the future, and I'm about to tell it to you. There will be three empires after you for a total of four. And then after that, that's the next one. There isn't a next one. That one is divided. How was he able to predict divided Rome, which, of course, Rome fell in 476 A.D. 476 A.D. to the present, you still haven't had a worldwide global empire that predominated as these ancient empires did over the known world at the time. Let's go to ver verse 43. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. So they're going to mingle with the seed of men. What, you're hearing a phrase there that the seed of men, that's a kind of an old English phrase. Other translations render this as the mixing with one another in marriage. Have you ever heard of Queen Victoria? She was known as the grandmother of Europe because there was so much intermarriage in the European royal families and bloodlines to try to reunite. It says they will attempt to reunite, but they will fail. It says they will, tr they will not adhere to one another, even though they're mingling the seed of men. In fact, much of European history after 476 AD, the next 15, 1600 years of history, are attempts to reconsolidate the former Roman Empire under one great conqueror. And you can go and name them all and study the whole history. We don't have time to do that. But it was specifically saying in Daniel, they're going to try to do it through intermarriage and it's going to fail. Have you ever heard of the European Union? You might say, haven't they reunited? Hardly. You've heard of Brexit. You've heard of attempts to reunite Europe under the United States of Europe. These are, if you read the Wikipedia phrase of United States of, of Europe, it's speculative fiction and science fiction, although some political scientists and historians have said, maybe Europe really will reunite. Well, we know from the Bible they won't. It says they shall not adhere. The iron and the clay in the feet do not mix. So you won't have that reuniting. So it's no surprise we're seeing the crumbling of what was an attempt to reunite Europe. 
Now, I, I used to be a, a history guy, but without the benefit of this prophecy, and I, I saw the developments in Europe. It was like the European Coal and Steel Agreement, the European Free Trade Agreements, the European Economic Commission, then you get the European Union. It seems like a development toward a you know, globalist concept in Europe, and they're going to be the United States of Europe. The trend seemed, and then that all reversed just in recent years. Pretty interesting. And, and take a look at the European Parliament building, this is fascinating. It looks an awful lot like the Renaissance painting of the Tower of Babel, doesn't it? Like, is that an accident or a coincidence? Or is this an attempt to reverse what God did when he divided the nations and the languages? Fascinating. Well, uh, let's read verses 44 and 45. I told you this is the best part. And in the days of these kings, meaning the divided Rome, sometime after 476 AD, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all those kingdoms, and it shall stand forever, inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. Can you say amen to that? Because it's the inspired word of God, and we have the benefit now of looking back at history and going, wow, how is that possible? Well, with God, all things are possible, and this is not a difficult thing for God. Well, there's the list of the kingdoms in Daniel 2. It says, Babylon, you are this head of gold, and then after you, and then after that one, and then after that one, a really strong one, and then that one will not be conquered, but divided, and then Christ's kingdom will come. I put near future for that. We don't have a date for that. But Daniel 7, we're going to study now. Let's go flip a couple of pages to Daniel 7, and we're going to see these four repeated with additional detail. And then we'll see the, the little horn power, the Antichrist power, come out of that. So let's begin in chapter 7, verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream. So now this is a different Babylonian king, Belshazzar. And he had visions on his, in, uh, of his head while on his bed. So Daniel's having this vision. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great, what? What's the next word? Beasts came up from the sea, each different from each other. Now, we can wonder and guess and speculate about what beasts represent in Bible prophecy. I really love it that the Bible just tells us. Look at verse 23. It says, the fourth beast shall be a fourth, what? Kingdom. Look at verse 17. Same thing. Those great beasts which are four are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. So this is going to be kingdoms again. This is going to feel very familiar as we go through these four. Let's begin with the four in verse, in verse four. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. You see the artist's representation there of the lion with eagle's wings. Now, it's interesting, it's fitting that l the lion is used for the first kingdom because when you look at the archaeology of Babylon, the lion was the national symbol of Babylon. And you can look in the British History Museum to this day, the, the remnants from the Ishtar Gate from ancient Babylon, where on processional way you would be greeted by the national symbol of the lions. But let's finish the verse there because you're going to see the actual story of Nebuchadnezzar himself. He says, I watched till its wings were plucked off. And it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man. And a man's heart was given to it. Do you remember when Nebuchadnezzar had so much pride? He said, I'm going to have a statue of all gold because the whole thing's going to be gold, not just the head. And God had to humble Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4 and send him out into the wilderness like a beast to be a madman. After which time he humbled and he gave glory to God. And he said, God sets up kingdoms and he deposes them. And so Nebuchadnezzar came to the point where he wasn't so beast-like anymore. He, it says he stood on two feet like a man and had a man's heart given to him, a converted heart, a new heart. Beautiful. We're probably going to sing Nebuch see Nebuchadnezzar in the kingdom with this conversion you read about there. Now let's read verse 5 because we're going to get to the second of the four. Verse 5, And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear. It was raised up on one side, and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. So this is the one that right next, suddenly, the very next one, just like it said, after you comes the next one, suddenly, arise, devour much flesh, comes this new empire. 
and the first one's gone. It's devoured now. Well, what is, what is this in, in, in succession in history? You know what after Babylon came Medo-Persia, but what's particularly fascinating about the symbolism used here is Medo-Persia has two components to it, the Medes and the Persians, and this one is raised up on one side, and it has three ribs in its mouth. Is that a coincidence that the Medes and the Persians, as Cyrus the Great was conquering and establishing his empire, there were three nations that were subdued as he became the ruling power, Babylon, of course, Egypt, Lydia, these nations were subdued, and he's got three ribs in his mouth. Verse 6, after this I looked, and there was another like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. So this leopard, is that a fast or a slow animal? That's an ultra-fast animal, right? It's like their fastest animal. And then you add wings to that, and you've got the fastest conquering conqueror in the history of conquest. Who's that? Who was the fastest, most efficient conqueror in history? Alexander the Great. Of which empire? The Greek Empire. Oh, and not just that, but Alexander the Great died early at age 33. He did not appoint a successor to his empire. And they asked him, supposedly at his death, who does the empire go to? And he said, to the strongest. And so the four generals carved up the territory. How many generals did I say? How many territories of the Greek Empire? Four. How many heads are on that beast? Four. Fascinating. So how did Daniel know to predict this hundreds of years in advance with the four heads and the speed and, and the Nebuchadnezzar's heart and all of this and the, and the, the, the beast up on one side and the three ribs? Uh, it's impossible through human wisdom. By the way, Daniel also in chapter 8 names Greece by name. Greece was nothing in the days of Daniel and the days of Babylon. Greece was no big deal at all. Saying Greece would be, the, be a major power and player on the world stage would be laughable in Daniel's day. It would be like saying, oh, pick your small country. I don't want to say it because I might offend somebody. But anyway, today, pick some you know, country that you know is not going to conquer the world. That's what Greece was at that time. But Alexander sure changed that, conquered the world real fast. Now let's go to verse 7. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge, what kind of teeth? Iron teeth. Iron, just like the legs of iron in the previous one, because this is number four, isn't it? And it was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all beasts that were before it. Now let me pause right there. What was the longest lasting, the long legs of iron, that most powerful, represented by the iron here, you hear again about smashing everything, devouring everything in its way, just like you heard in Daniel 2. This again is the fourth empire in succession from Babylon, the Roman Empire. Now the rest of the verse 7 is very interesting because it says, and it had ten horns. Ten horns. Well, what are these horns? I appreciate again. The Word of God always gives the truth with crystal clarity. Verse 23 tells us what the ten horns are. If let's begin with what it says about the fourth beast. Thus he said, I'm in verse 23, The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom. So this is after that Roman Empire, you're going to get ten kings that arise from that kingdom. Well, isn't that interesting? Because when we saw the feet of baked clay and iron, and they weren't adhering to one another, you had a divided Rome. And now you have a multiplicity of kings instead of a single unitary imperial power. You have the ten kings of the Western Roman Empire, which are today many of today's modern European nations that, that were established there in 476 AD as becoming more autonomous, not under the power of Rome. So this, what we've seen right here, super clear from the Bible, but you might go, is this like a, I've never heard this before, is this some novel interpretation? Like, did somebody, you know, somebody on their web page come up with that? Well, what I want to show you is something very, very fascinating. A Bible teaching in stone. What do you mean in stone? Stone carvings, stone structures, stone images that are placed, I'm going to show you the graphics in just a minute, but 
in, in the capital of Protestantism, in Germany, in Nuremberg, they have four stone images, representing these four here, at the, uh, over, the, over the doorways. I want you to see what you see in these. Do you see a lion with eagle's wings there? And what does that general or, or, or king look like? That looks like a Babylonian, doesn't it? With the facial features and the, the, the dress. Is that Nebuchadnezzar himself or a Babylonian soldier? This one looks quite Persian, doesn't it? And you see the bear there. It's hard to tell the three ribs in its mouth, but they do have the three ribs in its mouth. Maybe that's meant to be Cyrus or just a Persian. Uh, this one looks very Greek. Is that Alexander the Great? You see the leopard with four heads denoting the Greek empire. And then last of all, the terrible looking beast. We never know quite how to portray that one, but that one certainly a Roman centurion and you have the ten horns coming out of that beast. So this is not some like new thing. This is something that's been well established and understood in Bible believing Christianity and Protestantism for, for centuries, going back to the 1500s when they put this up. So let's look at now the little horn. This is where we're getting to the heart of the matter about the beast power, the little horn power, the Antichrist power, the man of sin. Daniel 7 verse 8. I was considering the horns. Which horns was he considering? The ten horns. So he was thinking about those horns that came after the beast, the terrible beast, the Roman Empire. And he says, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them. Now, let me pause right there, because as we go through this verse, you're collecting little facts and identifiers about who this little horn power is. And so pay close attention to all of the identifiers of this little horn power. First, we noticed he's coming up after the ten, right? And then it's that he's little. And then it's that he's coming up among the ten. And where are the ten? They are in Europe, right? Before whom three of the first were plucked out by the roots. There's another identifier. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. Jump over to verse 23. We're going to get more on this little horn. But you see uh, uh, the, the image of a man at its head speaking pompous words. Verse 23, the fourth beast again shall be the fourth kingdom, and it's trampling and breaking everything in pieces. Then verse 24, the ten horns are the ten kings who arise from the Roman Empire, from that fourth kingdom. And then here's where we get to the little horn in the middle of verse 24. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High. So he's different from the other secular kings in that he has a religious agenda here, speaking against the Most High, pompous words. He shall persecute the saints of the Most High and shall intend to change times and law. Now that wouldn't be a remarkable thing to say about a king who comes to power. They always change secular law. Well, he's got an agenda against divine law. The very times and laws of God is what would be noteworthy for a king who is speaking pompous words against the Most High. Otherwise, it wouldn't be worth mentioning if he's simply changing run-of-the-mill secular law. So this is a spiritual conflict. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for how long? A time? and times, and half a time. Okay, let's review here. This kingdom will be small. This power will be small. It will arise among the ten. In other words, in Europe. It will arise after the ten, it said in verse 24. So after 476, we will see this power arise. It plucks up three horns, or three of the ten kingdoms, or tribes, of the former Roman Empire, Western Roman Empire. It has the eyes and mouth of a man. It is a religious power with great words and blasphemies, persecutes the saints, thinks to change times and law, and rules for a time, times, and half a time. Okay, that's a lot. We're going to go through all of those by God's grace. First of all, what is this thing about a time, times, and half a time? Just what is that? And then we'll come back to that time. But that tenth one, a time, times, and half a time, you're like, what is that? Well, a time, times, and half a time would denote a year, 
and then times being a unstated multiple or a plurality of years, since the number is not given, assumed in the original context and language to be two, and then half a time would be half a year. A time means a year. God said to Nebuchadnezzar, seven times shall pass over you, and he was seven years in that consequence, in that discipline. So a time, times, and half a time, one year, two years, and half a year. Did you do the math yet? Let's put it back up there. One, two, and half equals three and a half years. Now, wait a minute. I've heard three and a half years elsewhere. In Revelation 13, in Revelation 12, it's called 42 months. It's called 1,260 days. Well, 1,260 days is exactly three and a half Jewish years of 360 days per year. 42 months is exactly three and a half years. 42 months is exactly 1,260 days of the Jewish year of 360 days. So we've got the exact time that this power is going to rule for. So that's going to be able to narrow this down pretty well. But actually, you can just take the first three here, and a secular historian could look, could look at just these three without any religious doctrine or Bible truth or loving of Jesus and his truth. You could just, as a secular cold scholar, look at this and be like, okay, a little kingdom that arises in Europe after 476 AD. Well, that narrows it down to one. All Bible-believing Protestants in the 1500s, in the 1600s, in the 1700s, this used to be a universal doctrine in Protestantism. Just as much as salvation through faith and through the merits and blood of Jesus Christ that launched the Protestant Reformation. This idea was so universally understood that today it feels controversial, but you go back any time in those centuries and all of Protestantism was on the same page historically and scholarly in terms of the history as well. It's just a matter of the historical record. One little kingdom that was little in its geographical scope arose in Europe after 476 AD, and that was Vatican City. In other words, the papacy, the Roman church state. It was geographically small. It arose specifically in 538 AD, so a few decades after 476 AD. 538 AD was when the last of the three barbarian tribes was subdued that were resisting the power and supremacy of the Bishop of Rome. Now, well, isn't that interesting? How many did I say were subdued there? Because we had the, the, the fourth identifier there was that he subdued three kings. The last of the three was subdued in 538 AD. And also, the secular emperor at the time, Justinian, proclaimed the Bishop of Rome in 538 AD to be the head of all of the churches. So the papacy was born in 538 AD. There had been a bishop in Rome before that, and there had been distortions that were coming in as we studied last night. But he officially acquired that power as head of all the churches, and those last three were subdued. The Heruli, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals were the barbarian tribes that were taken down as the supremacy of the Pope of Rome was established in 538 AD. Now you're all wanting to do some math with me right now, aren't you? Maybe you never wanted to do math in school, but you really want to do math right now because you're going, I know how many years this power is supposed to rule. And if th this should check out if this is correct because all of these identifiers have to be fulfilled, not just three of them. And there's only one power that fulfills even those three, but I want to see all 10 to make sure. Okay, so let's do some math. 538 A.D., let's go three and a half years from that to 541 A.D., 542 A.D. Uh, you're like, well, no, the papacy ruled for a lot longer than that. Okay, remember when we did Daniel 9, when it wasn't, one, it wasn't 483 days till the Antichrist, or till, the, till Christ, till the Messiah comes, but it was 483 years from 457 B.C. that Jesus came exactly on time in 27 A.D., was anointed as the Messiah. A day in Bible prophecy equals a literal year. We acquire that truth from Ezekiel 4, verse 6, from Numbers 14, 34, and the fact that it worked with the Messianic prophecy of Daniel 9. And it said three and a half years into that, he's going to be cut off, but not for himself. In the middle of the last seven years of the prophecy, he's going to be cut off, but not for himself, and then sacrifice will end. It was an incredible prophecy that predicted the exact year Jesus would come to be anointed as the Messiah and exactly when he would be crucified 
And the gospel message just cries out from the pages of Daniel 9 to so many people who have not studied the, one of the most amazing texts in the whole Bible. That's why we did it night number one. It's one of my favorites. Well, so you know, a day in Bible prophecy, when Daniel said 483 days until the anointed one comes, the Messiah, well, that worked out to 483 years, not 483 literal days. A day in Bible prophecy being a, a literal year. So let's do the math on this 1,260 day prophecy. Where did we get that number from again? Remember it was a time times and half a time or 42 months or 1,260 days. So all three of those, it's stated a number of times in Daniel and in Revelation, 1,260 days would then mean 1,260 what? Years. Okay, let's do the math. 538 A.D. Fast forward 1,260 years, and what year do you get to? You get to the year 1798. Did something happen to the Vatican in 1798? Oh yeah, Napoleon was rampaging across Europe. He made his way to Italy. He made his way to the Vatican. His general, Berthier, literally took the Pope captive in 1798 A.D., exactly 1,260 years after the papacy arose to its prominency in 538 A.D. Um, you think Daniel had some insight from God here. The Bible is proven valid and trustworthy and credible again. Let's go through some more of these. We talked about the subduing of three kings. How about the eyes and mouth of a man? Well, that one's easy. You've got the Pope of Rome at the head of this power, of this, of this entity. Is this power a religious power? Uh, yep, that one checks out for sure. How about number seven? That was pompous words, blasphemous words. I want to spend a little bit of time on that. Because we have to say, what is blasphemy? Biblically speaking, we have two definitions of blasphemy. One of them comes from John 10, verse 33. The Jews said to Jesus, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. Because you, being a man, make yourself God. Now, was that blasphemy when Jesus said, Before Abraham was, I am? That was not blasphemy, because he has every right to do that, because he has divinity. But would it be blasphemy? If a mere man said, I am in the position of God, I am in the place of God, well, that's, that's Luciferian. He said, I will be ascending into the position of God. So that's one definition of blasphemy. Has the Roman papacy made such claims? Let's look at a statement by Pope Leo XIII in an encyclical letter where he says, the supreme teacher in the church is the Roman pontiff. Union of minds, therefore, requires, together with a perfect accord in the one faith, here's what they require, here's what the Pope requires, complete submission and obedience of the will to the church and to the Roman pontiff as to God himself. Okay, I think we got it clear enough there. He said, I'm to be obeyed as God himself. And he also said, we hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. That would be blasphemy by the biblical definition. Another definition of blasphemy from the Bible comes from another statement in the time of Jesus where he was forgiving people's sins. But before I share that one with you, I want to highlight the fact that, have you noticed in our society right now, there's an awful lot of division and hate and conflict. And I hope that we wouldn't take these realities of the blasphemous, dark, and satanic nature of this power and slam people with that and cause more hate and conflict and go to people with a combative attitude. That we want to absolutely annihilate if that would ever rise up in our spirit and give pride place to condemn others. Most Catholics don't even know that their Pope said that, right? And even if they did, we want to love people into the truth, not slam them into the truth. But that was a blasphemous statement. Um, so we can't hold back on the truth and like hide it under a bushel. We got to go 100% grace and 100% truth. Jesus was filled with grace and truth. But because if someone believes that salvation comes through works and sacraments and forgiveness comes through a priest and truth comes through tradition, they're in a position of being in darkness and God wants to bring them light and free them from that. So here's the other definition of blasphemy. And the scribes and Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Well, Jesus can because he had divinity. But can the priests of the Roman Catholic Church, when they say, Ego te absolvo, I absolve you of your sins, 
Well, there's a web page called Catholic.com, and the Catholic Answers asks the question, how can a priest forgive sins? And here's the answer from the Catholic authority. The priest stands in the place of Christ to declare the sinner forgiven. Now, what is the definition of antichrist in the Strong's Concordance? It is in the place of Christ. So, you see, we can forgive sins because we are in the place of Christ. Wow. The Bible says there is one mediator between God and man, the man God and, and us, the man Jesus Christ, 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. And God has actually declared us to be the priesthood. It was Peter, Peter in 1 Peter 2, verse 5, who said, you are a holy priesthood. If Peter was supposedly the first pope, I'd love to hear the other popes talk more like Peter and say, you're all the priests. We can disband this thing of human beings giving you the forgiveness. God gives you the forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Revelation says we are all priests three times. I love the threes in the Bible, don't you? In 1, verse 6, in 5, verse 10, and in 20, verse 16, it says we are all priests. Here's some more quotes from Reverend Johnny, John Anthony O'Brien in The Faith of Millions, a doctor of the church, a priest. He says, when the priest announces the tremendous words of consecration, in other words, over the, over the elements, the bread and the wine, he reaches up into the heavens, brings Christ down from his throne, and places him upon our altar to be offered up again as the victim for the sins of man. It is a power greater than that of saints and angels, greater than that of seraphim and cherubim. The priest brings Christ down from heaven and renders him present on our altar as the eternal victim for the sins of man. Not once, but a thousand times. The priest speaks, and lo, Christ, the eternal and omnipotent God, bows his head in humble obedience to the priest's command. That's a pretty good definition of blasphemy right there. That You couldn't really make a caricature of blasphemy better than that one. It sounded made up. I had to confirm, like, is this real? Is somebody making up quotes? That's, he said that. I couldn't believe it. During the Dark Ages, persecution of the saints. During the Dark Ages, the Vatican was responsible for the deaths of multiplied millions. We're talking about tragedies like the St. Bartholomew's Massacre. Upwards of 120 million people slaughtered for going against the teachings and authority of the Pope of Rome. You can go to Europe today, stand on the very place where they burn people at the stake. Now, we don't have time to recount all of that dark history, but that is sadly another fulfillment of another identifier with number eight there. We also had number nine, changing times and laws, thinks to change times and laws, because you can't actually change the law of God. You'd have to go up into heaven, you'd have to take the lid off the Ark of the Covenant and scratch things out and do some chiseling work. I'll tell you, Uzzah died when he just touched the Ark of the Covenant. That's another definition of blasphemy to say, we're going to go ahead and just cross off number two. We saw that last night, the second commandment removed from the Vatican.va catechistic listing of the Ten Commandments. The second commandment, the one that prohibits graven images, because we have veneration of images. Going back to the early times with the image you saw of St. Peter, who had been the pagan god Jupiter, quote after quote after quote and statement after statement we saw yesterday about the change of the Sabbath, thinks to change times and laws, specifically about those laws relating to the divine time, ordained, sanctified in Eden. And we saw all the quotes. Yes, the Bible teaches the seventh day, most definitely. You can search the scriptures and not find a single line authorized Sunday, but we changed the day. The church changed the day. The church transferred the solemnity from the seventh day to the first day and made the commandment refer to Sunday. I won't repeat all the quotes, but you heard them the other day. Here's a statement from Cardinal Gibbons about this very issue. He says, reason and sense demand the acceptance of one or the other of these two alternatives. And he's absolutely correct about this. One of these two, either Protestantism and the keeping holy of Saturday, or Catholicity and the keeping holy of Sunday. He says compromise is impossible. It's the Bible and Protestantism which bases its faith on the Bible, or it's Catholicism and church authority. The Bible says the seventh day, the church says the first day, and it's a struggle between where is the authority placed, the word of God or the traditions of man. This is a statement also from Reverend O'Brien, he says, but since Saturday, not Sunday, is specified in the Bible, isn't it curious that non-Catholics who profess to take their religion directly from the Bible and not from the church observe Sunday instead of Saturday? That is curious, isn't it? He goes on and says, yes, of course it is inconsistent. 
But the change was made 1,500 years before Protestantism was born, and they have continued to observe the custom, even though it rests upon the authority of the church and not upon an explicit text in the Bible. That observance remains the reminder of the mother church from which all non-Catholic sects broke away, like a boy running from his mother, but still carrying in his pocket a picture of his mother's of his mother or a lock of her hair. So he's saying all of the Protestants that are keeping that first day of the week as their Sabbath day are recognizing the authority of the church as their real true mother. I want to look at the verse here at the end of Daniel chapter 7, the best verse of them all. It says then, after all this, after Babylon, Greece, Medo-Persia, Sorry, I said that backwards. I was thinking about the next thing I'm going to say. I shouldn't do that, should I? Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, divided Rome, and they will attempt to reunite through marriage and will fail and will not reunite. And then the little horn coming out of divided Rome, and that little horn will rule for 1,260 years. The rest of the prophecy is where we get to the good part. Because darkness doesn't reign for eternity. Deception doesn't conquer truth. It seems like it's extinguished it in the dark ages for a thousand years. But Daniel saw all along, this darkness will not last. The kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him, the rock. Hit the statue at the feet. All human kingdoms and human pride and the elevation of man's authority over the word of God are annihilated and blow away like the chaff. And that rock fills the mountain, fills the earth as a mountain. God's kingdom will be universal. All deception, all deceiving and dark and dangerous myths, all man's authority and proclamations of I will be above the word of God, I sit in the place of God. That's literally what it says in 2 Thessalonians 2. He will say, I sit in the place of God, showing himself that he is God. So here's the historical rundown of what we studied tonight. Daniel 2 left that gap there that's filled in by Daniel 7, giving us a little additional information in yellow. The little horn... And then, oh, the wound healed in the last days. You know what happened in 1929? There's a statement in Revelation 13, talking about the very last days, where the beast's mark will be enforced. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. And at that point, the, the, the papacy needs to make a comeback, because he was taken away captive in 1798, wasn't he? Well, something occurred geopolitically in 1929. The Italian dictator Mussolini chose to re-establish Vatican City as a political entity in 1929. Well, in Revelation 13, we don't have time to turn there, but it says that the beast power, after ruling for this 1,260 days, he's going to receive a deadly wound. We know that occurred in 1798. And then it says the deadly wound will be healed. So he makes a comeback. 1929 isn't a prophetic date, but it was a historic occurrence that we know is a healing of the deadly wound. Some of the newspapers at the time actually said, deadly wound is healed. I couldn't find the headline. If somebody could find that, send it to me. I want to see that headline. I saw it many years ago. Couldn't find it online. But here we are, cruising toward the mark of the beast crisis, aren't we? We are in the last days. And the final question for each person in the last days that we've been seeing all along in this series is, who will we worship? Who will we obey? Who has the authority in our lives? God's word, not my say-so, not human tradition. Jesus is coming back soon. It is coming soon as you see the signs of the times amplify and intensify in our world. So I ask myself what I ask you right now. Is there anything between you and Jesus? Is there anything keeping you from that full surrender to him and his requirements for you? It may not be another mediator. Maybe it's not a priest or veneration of icons that's between you and Jesus. If it is, Jesus wants to take that out of the way and bring the fullness of himself to you. You can come right to Jesus. He is your great high priest. But for all of us, no matter our walk of life and faith background, 
Is there something between us and Jesus that's keeping us from that deep connection, that full surrender, and that walking with God as Enoch did? You know, Enoch went to heaven without seeing death, and there will be many who are alive and remain until coming, the coming of the Lord. And if we are ready, if we are being cleansed and prepared and drawn to Jesus like Enoch did, walking with God, for this is eternal life, to know God, that's a relationship. That's a prayer life. That's a full surrender. And on this issue that we've been looking at on the Sabbath, saying, God, I accept that. Whatever you say to me, I will accept and do joyfully. I want to delight in your law. I want to know Jesus Christ. We identified Antichrist, but do you know Jesus Christ? That's the most important of all. Whatever is between you and him tonight, take that to the Lord in this closing prayer. Surrender that on the altar to him. Say, I am fully yours. Father in heaven, it is our desire to know that we are 100% sold out to you, that our full surrender is to you, that man's authority or our own preferences and traditions and likes and dislikes and what we want to do is, is nothing. We just say, thy will be done. So anything that is between us and you right now, we just say, Lord, take it away. We surrender it. We commit to going all the way with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you.